We continue in a, a brief series on a brief passage. Galatians 4, 4 and 5. It's my pleasure to read these words to you once again. And I ask once again that you would listen carefully, for this is the very word of God. Galatians 4, 4 and 5. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. May the Lord bless to our hearts and minds the reading of his word, and you may be seated. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we come before you acknowledging that this is a familiar season and a season in which it it is easy to get overwhelmed by all of the hustle and the bustle, to even be burdened by it all. But we pray that in these moments together, you would renew our vision to see the glories of Jesus in his person and work, that he would be magnified and exalted in our minds and hearts, and that you would give us strength to live with joy in these busy days. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. So what's the big deal with Christmas? Why all the pageantry, the decor, the special services and music? What's so special about Christmas? Well, you say it's Jesus, right? It's the birth of Jesus. That's what's so special. Jesus is the reason for the season. To which many will fairly ask, okay, so what's the big deal with Jesus? What's so special about the birth of a peasant boy born in a stable because there was no room in the inn? What's so special about him being laid in a manger, visited by shepherds and wise men? What's so special about the birth of this child that he would be heralded by angels? You say Jesus is what makes Christmas special. I say, okay, what's the big deal with Jesus? Well, answering that question is the driving force behind our December Christmas series. Over the course of this month, we have been and we will continue to be examining but two short verses, Galatians 4, 4 and 5. These verses, in a very concise and powerful way, answer the question, what's the big deal with Jesus? And we started this two weeks ago as we considered Paul's grand declaration that the coming of Jesus is a big deal, in fact, the biggest of deals. For Paul argues that the coming of Jesus marks the fullness of time, that Jesus himself ushers in the fulfillment of time, the fulfillment of the ages. For he is the great event in all of history. He is the goal, the purpose for which all time and history exist. And so his coming marks the fullness of time. But why, you say? Why is Jesus so, Jesus coming, why is it so significant? Well, we began to further unpack that a bit last week as we examined the uniqueness of Jesus' person. We saw how Paul declares that Jesus is God's own son, born of a woman. That is, he is the eternal divine son. He is the great I am, the Lord of heaven and earth who has always been. He is the fully divine person of the Godhead, who was with God the Father from the beginning and is himself God. And this God... This eternal God actually became flesh and dwelt among us. He he took to himself a full and complete human nature. He was made like us in every way, yet without sin. As we sang last week, Jesus is God of God, light of light. 
And yet he did not abhor the virgin's womb. He is true man, yet very God. So Jesus, in all the fullness of deity, dwelt and dwells in bodily form. And this, we declared last week, this is a big deal. This is very special, an event so special, so earth-shaking, so epoch-defining that Paul rightly declares this marks the fullness of time. But again, we say, okay, so Jesus' person is special, unique, time fulfilling. But what exactly does Jesus do? Ah, this then brings us to the next portion of Galatians 4, 4, and 5, where we read that this Jesus, whose coming fulfills time, who is God's Son, born of a woman, this Jesus was born under the law to redeem those who were under the law. This redemption, then, is the great activity of Jesus. And this is what we want to explore this morning. What it means for Jesus to be born under the law to redeem those who were under the law. Now, to do this, we want to ask three important questions. We will explore three important categories. The first question is this, who, that is, who is under the law? Who is under the law? Well, as we consider this question, I think we need to consider two different groups who have two different relationships to the law of God, but both of whom find themselves in various ways under the law. The first group is the Jews, the people of Israel. In, in, in a most proper and direct sense, the Jewish people are under the law, under the law of Moses. Many of you will know the biblical story that when God brought Israel out of bondage, out of Egyptian slavery through the plagues and the Passover and the exodus through the Red Sea, before he brought Israel into the promised land, he gave them his law. In Exodus 19 and following, we see that God meets with Israel at Mount Sinai. There he calls Moses and Aaron up onto the mountain. And there on Mount Sinai, he gives Moses his holy law to give to his people. And this law was a comprehensive law. It was a moral law, which was meant to instruct and rule over the behavior of each individual Israelite. This moral law, as many of you will know, is summarized in the Ten Commandments. This is also a ceremonial law that governed all manner of sacrifices and feasts and patterns of worship. It was also a civil law that governed Israel's life and function as a nation. And this comprehensive law was given to the entire nation of Israel through Moses. And the entire nation of Israel then entered into a formal covenant bond with God in which they pledged by solemn oath to do all the works of the law. In Exodus 24, verse 3 and following, we read that Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. And the people answered with one voice and said, all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Moses then offered a sacrifice in which he took uh, the blood of the sacrifice and he took half of the blood and he threw it against the altar on which the sacrifice had been offered. And then, once again, he took the book of the law. He read it in the hearing of the people. And once again, they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. And Moses then took the other half of the blood of the sacrifice and threw it on the people of Israel. And he said, behold the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these root words. So we see from this that the, the people of Israel, in, in a unique way, among all the peoples of the earth, were under the Mosaic law of God. The entire people were given the Mosaic law in all of its ceremonial and civil and moral precepts and all its commands. 
and as an entire people. They entered into a formal covenant that was sealed with blood to keep and obey all the words of God's law. Because of this, Paul could say in Romans 9, to the Israelites, in a unique way, belong the glory and the covenant and the giving of the law and the worship. You see, the Israelites were a people under the law of God. So Galatians 4, 4 and 5 is clearly speaking about the Jewish people. They are a people under the law. Which means that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem the Jews, the people who were under the law. The text certainly means that. But then we ask, well, does it only mean that? Are the Jews the only people who are under the law? Well, though the Jews are unique in their relationship to the Mosaic law. They are not alone in being under the law of God. The scripture says, in fact, that when God created our first parents, Adam and Eve, he placed them under a law. And in a very similar manner with what he did with Israel, God entered into a covenant with Adam and Eve. Hosea 6-7 uses this precise language, the language of a covenant, to describe God's relationship with Adam. And in this covenant, God gave Adam a law, a command that he was pledged to obey. What's clear from the scriptures is that in this covenant, Adam was not just a singular individual, but he was a representative of the entire human race. All of Adam's posterity were bound up in that covenant. So therefore, we are all under that law before God. What is more, the scripture says, that while all of the human race may may not know the Mosaic law, the law that was given to Israel on Mount Sinai, God, the scripture says, has actually written his law, his moral commandments on the hearts and the consciences of all people, giving all people an inner sense of what is right and wrong. Paul writes this in Romans 2, 14 and following, when Gentiles who do not have the law, by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show or they prove that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience bears witness. So what this means is that all people, people of every nation, tribe, and tongue, all descendants of Adam and Eve, we are all under the law of God in some sense. We're all under the law of God in Adam. We all have the moral law of God written on our conscience so that we have an innate sense of right and wrong. And to top it all off, the relationship of humanity being under the law of God, it's manifested in a particular way through the people of Israel. who who are covenantally singled out and subjected to the full Mosaic law that was given to them on Mount Sinai. So in these distinct but related senses, we can declare all people are under law. This is the who question then. Who is under the law? Everybody is under the law in some sense. Well, this brings us then to the second question, which is a why question. Why do people who are under the law need to be redeemed? For Paul writes that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. But why do people under the law need to be redeemed? Well, what we see in the scriptures is that God's law, in every sense, God's law given to Adam... God's law that is written on the hearts and consciences of all people, and God's law that is given to Israel on Mount Sinai. God's law always comes with potential blessings and potential curses. When God gave his law to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, the blessings and curses were clear. If Adam obeyed God's law, He would live in blessed communion with God, blessed communion with his wife, blessed communion with the the creation itself. Obedience would bring continued divine blessing. But if Adam disobeyed that law, he would be cursed, 
And specifically, he would be cursed with death. You see, disobedience brought divine judgment, curse, and death. In a similar way, Paul says that the law, the moral precepts of God that are written on the hearts and consciences of all people, they too come with potential blessings and curses. Paul writes this in Romans 2, 6 and following. He says, God will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, and here in context he's talking about the truth written on their own conscience, but obey unrighteousness, for them there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, for God shows no partiality. So just as it was with Adam, so it is with all people. Obedience to God's law, even that law written on the heart and conscience of all people, it brings God's eternal divine blessing. And disobedience to God's law, even that law written on the heart, brings divine judgment and curse and death. And then, of course, in a similar way, but in a a far more specific way, the law given to Israel on Mount Sinai, it too comes with potential blessings and curses. These blessings and curses are spelled out very specifically in Deuteronomy 28. Here in that chapter, uh, Moses, having preached the whole law to all the people again, spells out all the specific blessings that will come upon God's people if they keep the law. And then he spells out all the specific curses that will come upon the people if they disobey the law. You see, the principle with Adam, the principle with all people, is the same principle that's at work with Israel under the Mosaic law. Obedience brings divine blessing. Disobedience brings divine judgment and curse and death. And when we understand this principle, this principle of blessing and cursing as it's related to the law, well, then now the matter comes to a head. Why do people under the law need to be redeemed? Because all have sinned and fallen short of the law that they are under. We see very clearly in the scriptures, Adam disobeyed the command that he was given. And since he was our representative before God in that covenant, when Adam fell into sin, we all fell with him. Paul says this in Romans 5, sin came into the world through one man, that one man being Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, in Adam that is. One man's trespass then led to condemnation for all men. By the one man's disobedience, Paul says, the many were made sinners. Now Hosea 6, 7 makes it very clear, Adam broke the covenant that he had with God. He was under a divine law, he broke that divine law, and so he was subject to divine curse. You say, okay, 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 enough about Adam, what what about each one of us? Well, the scripture says, in addition to falling into the curse in Adam, we've all done a fine job sinning in our own right. Each one of us is guilty of sinning even against our own consciences. None of us is righteous before God, in one sense, because none of us is even righteous by the standard of our own hearts, the standard that God has revealed to us in creation and in our own conscience. Paul says in Romans 3, all people, even those who have no knowledge of the Mosaic law, are all under sin, for there is none righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. What about the Jews, you say? (laughs) Doesn't their possession of the Mosaic law with all of its precepts and commands, doesn't doesn't it kind of get them out of this fate? No, the scripture says, not at all. 
rather than exempting them from divine curses because they possess the law, rally, it, it, it only plunges them deeper and deeper into the wrath and curse of God. For the people under the Mosaic law have, have an even clearer understanding of what God requires. And in the end, this, this clear knowledge only increases condemnation. Because there's so many specific ways that they fail to disobey God's word. They fail to obey and they disobey God's word. Rather than being the source of salvation, the law of Moses, the scripture says, only serves to heighten guilt. So that Paul can say in Romans 3, we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So what we see here is that the principle of blessing and curse is present everywhere God's law is found. It's present in the covenant given to Adam. It's present in the law written on the hearts and consciences of all people. And it's present in the law given to Israel on Mount Sinai. And everywhere God's law has been given, God's law has been broken. Adam broke the covenant. We all break the law written on our own hearts. And Israel broke the law given to them on Sinai. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of such sin is death and God's divine judgment and curse. And what this means is that everyone, Jew and Gentile, we are all under sin. For we are all under law. And everyone, Jew and Gentile, then needs to be redeemed from the weight and curse of of the law and the weight and curse of our sin. Which brings us then to the final question for the morning. How? How does Jesus, the divine Son of God, born of woman, redeem those under the law? This is what we must know, right? Because it is this act of redemption that ultimately makes Jesus such a big deal. So special, the very fullness of time. And what we see from the text is that this act of redemption begins with Jesus being born under the law. Though he was in very nature God, Jesus took to himself a full and true human nature. In his, in his humanity, then, he was fully and comprehensively subjected to the full and comprehensive law of God. Jesus was subjected to the law of God just as Adam was. Paul, in fact, refers to Jesus as the second Adam. And as the second Adam, Jesus was not only under the law of God as a singular individual, but as a representative of all of God's people. Jesus also, just like, just like we do, he had the law of God written on his heart, on his conscience, so that he had an innate sense of right and wrong, as all people do. And Jesus was not just born of a generic woman, he was born of Mary. That is, he was born a Jew. And as a Jew, he was then covenantally bound to God under the fullness of the Mosaic law. I think we can say Jesus was under the law of God as fully and as comprehensively as any man has ever been. No stone of God's law was unturned in his life. And then the full weight of God's law with all of its potential blessings and all of its potential curses was placed on his shoulders. So with the weight of the world on his shoulders, we ask, so what did Jesus do? Well, in the life of Jesus, a most remarkable thing happened. A thing that has never happened before, and it has never happened since. A human being lived a life under God's law without 
sin. That's right. Jesus announced that he came to fulfill the law of God, but I tell you today, he did. The scripture says Jesus was the Holy One of God. And it's not just a superlative title without meaning. No, the scripture says he was tempted and tried in every way that we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4.15. He knew no sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. 1 Peter 2.22. In Jesus, there was no sin. 1 John 3.5. Well, what this means then is that Jesus and Jesus alone was entitled to all the blessings of God's law. Jesus and Jesus alone was entitled to eternal life and eternal blessedness as the result of his obedience. For he fulfilled the law. He fulfilled the Adamic law, the law written on the conscience of every person, and he fulfilled the law of Moses to the letter. He fulfilled it all in thought and word and deed. He fulfilled it to the uttermost, and in so doing, he established before God a perfect human righteousness in which in his humanity he was entitled to all the eternal blessings of God as the reward for his obedience. What this means is Jesus would have been fully entitled to simply ascend into heaven and enjoy eternal fellowship with the, with the Father and the Spirit, not only as the eternal Son, but as the eternal God-man, the divine Son become flesh. And yet, what did Jesus do? He was not only born of woman, born under the law, he not only submitted to that law and perfectly obeyed it, But then in his perfect obedience, he took all the sin of all his people upon himself. He took the sin of Adam upon himself. He took the sin of his people from every tongue and tribe and nation. Those who had violated the law written on their conscience, he took that sin upon himself. And he took the sin of all his people who who knew the Mosaic law and yet disobeyed it again and again. He took all the sin of all his people upon himself. And then there on the cross, he suffered the full penalty for all our law breaking. He suffered it in his own body, in his own sinless humanity. He suffered the full wages of our sin. To use the language Paul uses in in Romans 2, he suffered the tribulation and distress for every evil that his people had ever committed. He suffered the wrath and fury of the Father for every sin that his people had ever committed and would ever commit. As Isaiah 53 declares, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53 goes on to say, it was was then the will of the Lord to crush him. The Lord has put him, that is Jesus, to grief when his soul makes an offering for sin. You see, brothers and sisters, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. And this is the glory of Christmas. But we must know that the father sent the son so that Jesus could live the life under the fullness of the law that we should have lived. And having lived that life, he freely chose to die the death that we all deserve to die. He died for our sin in our place, and in doing so, he redeemed us. That is, he he paid the purchase price of our salvation. He redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Jesus paid it all on the cross, and then he rose from the grave, which was a 
God the Father's declaration to all time, to all nations, to those in heaven and on earth and under the earth. It was the Father's declaration that he accepted Christ's sacrifice for the sin of his people. I love what Phil Riken says in his commentary on these verses. Dr. Riken writes, Christ had to be born before he could die, of course. There could be no Easter without Christmas. But God the Son was born of the Virgin Mary in order to die on the cross. Christianity is not a religion of stable and straw. It is a religion of thorns and nails, wood and blood. The incarnation cannot save us without the crucifixion. Jesus did not redeem us by his life alone. He redeemed us through his death. Or if Phil Riken's not your cup of tea, consider what John Stott said in his commentary on these verses. He said, so the divinity of Christ, the humanity of Christ, and the righteousness of Christ uniquely qualified him to be man's redeemer. If he had not been man, he could not have redeemed men. If he had not been a righteous man, he could not have redeemed unrighteous men. And if he had not been God's son, he could not have redeemed men for God and made them sons of God. I like Phil Riken, so I'll quote him one more time. He writes, Christ did redeem us, and he did it as the perfect God-man who died on the cross to save sinners. Amen, brothers and sisters. Jesus was born, he lived, and he died to save sinners like you and me. Jewish sinners, Gentile sinners, sinners of every people, tongue, tribe, and nation. Which, which brings me to a simple conclusion for the morning. I want to call on each and every one of you to believe in Jesus Christ. To believe in his glorious person to believe in his redeeming work. He is indeed God's son, born of a woman, fully God and fully man. He was born under the law and he lived in perfect righteousness and he died a full and comprehensive atoning death for all the sin of all those who would believe on him. He rose again in glorious victory over sin and death and he will reign forever and ever. So let us believe in Jesus Christ this Christmas season. I know many of you have believed in him for many years, so let us then renew our faith in Christ this Christmas season. As we remind one another that Jesus is a big deal, the biggest of deals, special beyond measure, the very fullness of time and salvation. <laughs> May every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, if there's anyone here today who has never put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that even today, even this moment, would be the day of salvation. And for your people who have trusted you and walked with you, would you renew our vision to see with, in a fresh way the glory of Jesus in his person, the glory of Jesus in his redeeming work. And oh, may we worship him and rejoice in him and follow him with heartfelt obedience all of our days. Oh Lord, may this Christmas season not be one of mere sentiment, but may it truly be a season of renewed worship. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.